So let's start. Let's see what this uh, group in this Rensselaer campaign is about. Well, first of all, um, I, I'd like to say that we've seen a shift into this uh, Rensselaer, uh, the business model in the past uh, few years. So basically uh, we could observe uh, three different models. And uh, recently uh, the idea actually behind these attacks is that we see more and more um, common things between the ransomware attacks and the APT-like or the targeted attacks of uh, which is the usual, usual for uh, criminal monetization. So um, basically what the message here is, um, it's not really like regular um, malware or extremely spread cybercrime. We've seen the ransomware attacks using um, exploits and uh, some uh, uh, remote code execution exploits and lots of uh, um, lots of commonalities with more targeted attacks and uh, that also includes well previously um, we also see uh, we also saw some uh, uh, different models of uh, affiliate programs and uh, well I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, more about this specifically for this group but this shift is important into this uh, market, I would say, if we can call that, uh, of ransomware. Um, so the, the evolutionary path uh, for this uh, specific group, it's, some, it's an interesting aspect. So we first start, uh, actually, they started with another ransomware, which was called uh, JS Worm. I'm going to mention this um, also. But this one in August 2019 is interesting because it's uh, it's a slight shift into the, the operations because this one is not a ransomware. This is from the same group, and this is called Raspberry Rat. We spotted that in 2019. Uh, so basically, the actor here is um, trying to sell the, his creation, and uh, he mentions uh, like all the features and things that uh, the, the rat is capable of doing. And it, it starts this with this, um, the, the story starts with here. Uh, also a little bit uh, earlier with JS Worm, another rancher that I'm going to talk about as well. But then there is this um, rat here in 2019. Uh, by the way, the rancher, the JS Worm, uh, we spotted that around May, also in 2019. Um, but yeah, so the, the rat, uh, it, it uh, well, JS Worm also published a, a, a screenshot of uh, the capabilities of the rat. And uh, one thing that he's very proud about is what he calls uh, the hide VNC uh, protocol or feature. And uh, that's particularly interesting because, uh, you know, when criminals actually uh, uh, put some names in things that we uh, apparently we don't know. And then we have, uh, sometimes we have a hard time uh, trying to figure out what they are talking about. But in that case, it's basically a VNC uh, connection. So a remote connection to see the victim's user. And uh, they, they started calling that HVNC protocol, which is not really anything different than VNC. It's just uh, they uh, appended this um, hide uh, suffix and uh, that's one of the interesting features of this uh, rat, but it's a rat in general. Uh, the fact is that this helped uh, this actor actually to get some reputation in underground forums when they started this, and, and also the JS Worm um, ransomware, which is the, the topic of this, the, the current uh, screenshot. So yeah, for this, uh, with this ransomware here, I also published, they also started advertising this in 2019. Um, then the, the reputation started to increase uh, like more than, uh, than expected because well, it, it really worked and they had like different versions. Uh, some of them were, uh, people could actually decrypt others and then they started fixing things. But then the, the important thing here is, is the, the partnership and the affiliates program. You know, it's very clear 
that they have these affiliate programs very well designed. In that case, uh, they say in the bottom that they work in a model where 70% of the, the, the money made, uh, the ransom paid by the victims uh, stays with the affiliates and then 30% for the developers in that case for uh, the group that we call uh, Water Rock, which is the group of uh, JS World. Uh, actor. So this is well designed and uh, advertised with pretty much everything that uh, an affiliate um, uh, needs to know to start uh, to join the program and start victimizing as well. Uh, yeah, so um, this this program is actually well the the, the name to uh, the, then they moved to a different uh, rancher. Uh, it's still in 2019 that it is known as NMT. And this is interesting because we've seen in a single year three different uh, Maurer families by the same group, right? And uh, well, although this, uh, most of our studies based on Nephilim, uh, in order to understand the Nephilim business model and its evolution, uh, it's really important to understand the evolution of the other um, the other malware that they that they've uh, developed. So yes, uh, NMT affiliate program started in the, in, in 2019, and uh, it also featured some uh, well, well some features that JS One Rancher also had, and a few more, uh, including things that they they seem to be really proud about as support for Windows XP and uh, the file size of the final ransomware payload. Uh, we also spotted another ad from, uh, from MT ransomware that is uh, based on, uh, it's very similar to the previous one, although there are more uh, information on this. Uh, first, they say that they have only 25 seats for affiliates. And uh, they also mentioned that they will not uh, attack or work on CIS um, countries, and uh, but this one actually is uh, this post was made by a different actor, so a different uh, name, different nickname that was advertising the same thing. So we started uh, creating our um, intelligence around that, and then realized that uh, maybe the actor has two different names. We maybe we are talking about two different people working in the same group. And that's what we um, we spotted. Uh, another interesting stuff was uh, when they started using. Uh, actually, we spotted this in a forum. Uh, one of the actors uh, was saying that uh, they they wanted someone uh, that could understand about cryptos because they they needed they had this need of uh, crypting and making like cobalt strike beacons undetectable, basically. And that also helps us to understand the, the whole thing. Yeah, so, so some characteristics about this group uh, involve like organization, the partnership management, and as you could see from the previous slides, uh, collaboration between uh, uh, people. Right? We have spotted at least two uh, different actors or two different handles, and uh, they have a limited number of, uh, of seats. Uh, there's also, we also believe there is a, a, um, a, like an interviewing process when, uh, when someone wants to be one of their uh, affiliates. So uh, that's really uh, organized um, in, in our understanding. So yeah, moving on to Nephilim. Um, then they started with Nephilim, which is another campaign, and uh, it's probably the biggest from, from this group, which is actually still active. Here's the victimization map that we came up with. Most of the victims, uh, as you can see, are in North America. And based on our observations, these, um, these victims, they, they, they started victimizing US uh, uh, around Q3 in 2020. From, from Q3 2010 to Q1 2021, but they actually have victims in the many different sectors and uh, in almost all continents. So um, we can't say um, they are targeting any specific 
uh, vector. They are actually targeting um, big companies in general. So any uh, company, um, big company can be a victim of these, these guys. Uh, the way in and how they do this, well, we've spotted two different um, um, vulnerabilities that they could uh, exploit. Actually, the first one is not really a vulnerability, it's basically a brute force in RDP. Uh, they also mentioned that, well, this was also spotted in JS Worm ransomware campaigns, uh, but in the past, JS Worm was more, um, it, it was distributed by phishing and uh, exploit kits and botnets and all kinds of things. But uh, Nephilim differently is actually uh, more uh, selective. So Microsoft RDP, uh, so brute forcing RDP servers for sure, we've seen this happening and also uh, vulnerability on Citrix uh, Netscaler, which is um, uh, actually also known as uh, ADP, I guess. So this vulnerability is also used by these guys to exploit um, the, the, as a way in. Then we come for the persistence uh, stage of the attack. Uh, some hacking tools or you know, sysadmin, network admin, and things like this, uh, this, this kind of tools are definitely uh, used for some uh, tasks during the attack. So um, we've seen process hacker be used to terminate security agents, so like antivirus, any kind of security products and things like this. Also PowerShell uh, and PowerShell scripts, of course, to uh, drop uh, like the Cobalt Strike beacons, which is actually next and uh, other kinds of uh, executables. But yeah, so the Cobalt Strike beacons are the, the one of the main, um, one of the key components of the persistence because uh, uh, it's it's going to, to talk back with, uh, it's like a C2, it's actually called a team server in the terminology of Cobalt Strike. Uh, and uh, well, these tools, uh, as, you, uh, as you may know, they are not, of course, they're not malicious uh, per se. They are just being used with malicious purposes. And uh, we understand it's not really easy to uh, defend uh, against them. Uh, and in case of the Cobalt Strike, they've, uh, they use different types of beacons, including uh, DNS beacons, which I particularly find uh, more difficult, even more difficult to, to defend uh, against. Uh, yeah, then we come to the phase of uh, pivoting laterally. So what they do once they are in, once they are inside the network and they have uh, have uh, persistence already uh, done. Uh, yeah, so Mimikatz for sure, it's almost present in you know, many, many different attacks or almost all kinds of attack that we can, um, that we hear of. Uh, we've also spotted them exploiting, and by the way, this is based on our observation of uh, some uh, incident responses that we've conducted. So uh, uh, what I'm presenting here to you today is really based on the real data that we've, uh, we've seen. Uh, yeah, so this privilege, privilege escalation vulnerability of Windows also, uh, we also spotted that being used. And uh, a small tool called uh, AD Find just to basically uh, enumerate uh, uh, everything that uh, they can using uh, this AD Find tool, which uh, connects to the Active Directory and then start enumerating uh, things. So this is. Uh, to move laterally and then find the, the most interesting target, which is probably, of course, uh, the, the, the file server or something, you know, some computers that have uh, interesting data. And uh, they look at the data. It's not really automated, uh, uh, an automated attack. So that's why also it's, a, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, it's challenging to defend. Then we come to the uh, exfiltrate part where they actually uh, steal some data. Yeah, so we spotted them using Megasync, which is basically uh, like an uploader tool or a synchronization tool. 
uh, of mega.nz, uh, which is a sharing uh, file sharing service. So they, they have accounts there and they use these accounts um, to receive data from the victims before encrypting. And that's what we call the double um, extortion model. Uh, and we also spotted them using FTP for this. So just uploading data to some FTP server. Yeah. So this gives us uh, actually different um, intelligence on IPs and accounts used with MegaSync. So we could collect a lot of interesting stuff about this group. Uh, talking about a little bit about the variants, uh, we, we've seen uh, different variants. They basically keep changing the extension. Uh, there's also a change on the programming language used. They started with C++, which is, by the way, the same language that the MMT was written. And then they changed to Go. And uh, after some time, they came back to C++, but then they started doing some uh, other stuff. Uh, in total, we well. This, by the way, these are the extensions that we've seen the, uh, using. But this uh, this is actually based on the, the affiliates can choose the extension. So that's not you can just trust on the extension uh, on uh, to do anything. I mean, uh, this is really uh, part of the configuration of the ransomware. So in total. We got, uh, these are unique numbers, by the way. So 77 uh, different uh, payloads and they use 22 different certificates. So the banners are signed and uh, 43 different public keys, uh, RSA public keys. This is to encrypt the generated uh, AES keys that encrypt each file. So each file has its own uh, AES, um, uh, random key that is generated and this key is encrypted by the RSA public key. We believe that the RSA public key is based on the number of uh, campaigns that we could be also taking as the number of uh, uh, yeah, campaigns started by the affiliates. So if you have a RSA public key, then that means you have a campaign. And then with uh, 43 different ones, unique ones, that would mean uh, 43 uh, different campaigns. But maybe they are from the same affiliates, right? So um, I'm not saying that uh, there are 43 affiliates out there. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the impact, I've uh, talked a little bit already about this. Uh, we have this plus plus and go versions, the AES, uh, encryption uh, used for encrypting the files. And by the way, this is uh, after the process of exfiltrating of stealing the data because they're gonna, uh, they are going to uh, try to, to do some extortion again uh, with the data uh, in case the victim doesn't pay, which is very common um, currently, right? Uh, they have JSON-based configuration in the most recent versions and some different operational modes. This is what I call operation modes. Basically, uh, with the ransom payloads, you can encrypt um, the attacker, the affiliates can encrypt a single directory, probably used for, I don't know, testing purposes or a very specific uh, type of attack. Once they are in, in the network, they can choose a directory and start encrypting, or they can just run the ransom uh, payload and encrypt all drives. And uh, as I said, this is, uh, uh, the way the ransomware is going to behave is actually configured um, by a JSON file. So uh, that's really, uh, really ready to be used by affiliates. That's a dendrogram of the current uh, 77 uh, samples that we have in uh, for Nephilim. And uh, it specifies actually um, how similar they are. This is using TLSH, it's a similarity. It's a locally sensitive algorithm that we've developed in Trend. So uh, we can say that we can see that there are mainly two groups. And these two groups are actually the ones because this is based on file structure. So uh, the C uh, compiled binaries and the Go compiled binaries would, of course, look very different. Uh, but then we can start grouping. Uh, by the, the characteristics of the uh, evolution. And this dendrogram helped us to understand how many variants of Nephilim Rancer um, exist out there. 
and uh, how they uh, evolved. Okay, so uh, for the ransom, they use uh, different uh, contacting emails that they put in ransom notes. Uh, we've seen lots of them using like, Proton Mail and Tutanota for obvious reasons of uh, you know, so law enforcement really can uh, you know have a hard time trying to to break into the security of this. Uh, but we also spotted some affiliates being uh, probably um, uncalled and using uh, mail.com and even iCloud. So that also uh, gave us many um, interesting uh, data about them. Uh, the CNC and the leakage blog, we've uh, identified some uh, actually first the, the team servers of Cobalt Strike that this group use. So with some high confidence, uh, we've seen uh, team servers in Netherlands. Uh, we can take it as a CNC of the ransomware, but in fact, it's just a team server that the Cobalt Strike Beacon connects to. And in Sweden, Bulgaria, France, Romania, UK, um, they are all uh, behind what we would call uh, bulletproof hosting uh, providers. But we've identified all these um, servers and with some medium confidence, also one server in the US. This is the leakage block that they use. Uh, it's behind a fast, uh, fast flux network. Uh, that's the same model as name team, by the way. And there's also a version behind an onion domain um, that we believe we've identified uh, the IP address of this. Uh, we have more details in the paper. So yeah, uh, on the partnerships, one thing, one interesting thing is um, we've seen that the, the NMT ransomware, not Netflix, but NMT ransomware, um, because they, it has a, it had a C2. Uh, and this C2 uh, was, um, they, they shared infrastructure with the, the same infrastructure from these guys, uh, which is a shop in the, in dark web, I'd say. So it's a Tor, it's a dot onion uh, shop for any kind of malicious and illegal stuff. So they've shared some infrastructure for more than a year. And uh, so there may be some connection here. Um, yeah, so recommendations. Uh, again, this is uh, that's almost an APT level attack, I would say. So they are organized, they um, leak the data in a very uh, organized way. And uh, actually in our paper, we described as, um, we, because we, we've been checking the data and if the data is online and they are very good actually at keeping the data, the, the stolen data online for downloading and uh, trying to convince um, the victims to pay. Uh, yeah, so once they are in, they study the, the targets network. We had a case, for instance, where they've uh, tried to deploy a Cobalt Strike beacon and it didn't work because the security agent uh, caught that. And then they came back uh, after several days with a signed uh, beacon and, and try it again. So uh, they are persistent. Uh, it's like uh, sometimes I was uh, you know, just joking with a uh, uh, my colleagues and say that, that that's like a, a pen test, but uh, well, the difference is that they have uh, all the time they want and they, they, and they don't need, uh, they don't have any scope, they can do whatever they want. So it's really uh, challenging to, to defend. Well, they did not victimize any uh, countries in the CIS and uh, they've been active for at least two years. So the model of affiliate uh, programs um, make the, the kill chains to look different. So one attack can kill chain of one victim can be very different from the other one because different affiliates may, have, may use different tools. So that's also something to consider when you are defending against them. I would say that uh, we have to be very careful when exposing things like RDP and uh, you know unpatched. Stuff I know. I know that these messages have been given like uh, uh, every uh, all over um, from from time to time. Uh, uh, everybody talks about this, but that's really important because that's literally the way they they get in. 
right? And, though, uh, and also the, there's hacking tools or sysadmin or network admin tools. Um, the policies uh, uh, for them should be very strict, I would say. In our report, we have uh, a full set of attribution, uh, well, data, not like that we've uh, attributed uh, who the real people are, but uh, there is more information about this that uh, you may want to um, look at. Uh, there is also the TTPs that we've mapped using the MITRE uh, attack framework and the full set of IOCs, including all the RSA keys, all the um, certificates, and the thumbprints, the hashes, and everything else. So, and uh, many more uh, details on the network infrastructure of the Cobalt Strike team servers and also the leakage blog. So, yeah, with this, I conclude with a final message. Uh, this um, defending against ransomware is actually, uh, I would say, it's a lost battle. We are actually defending against the affiliates, which are, we can say, um, hacking groups. So uh, if you are trying to defend against Rensher, it's really uh, not the way to go. Uh, you have to defend against uh, a hacking group, a whole hacking group that is going to use different tools to attack your network. And uh, one of them is Rensher, but um, you know the data is stolen. So there are many, many other stages that you can be victimized and uh, that needs our attention. With this, I conclude my presentation and I'll be around for uh, questions in the work adventure. Thank you.